as we uh, have noted, uh, the uh, name of our message is, uh, I'm going to make a note about my time here. I don't want to go over time. This is a split sermon, isn't it? <laughs> um, uh, the uh, Six Have Fallen is the name of the sermon, and the uh, 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 subject of the sermon is the Seven Revivals of the Roman Empire. And uh, the uh, uh, Roman Empire, uh, uh, it, uh, this is our keynote scripture. We're going to go back to this scripture uh, later on today. But uh, this uh, scripture is uh, uh, from Revelation 17, from uh, John writing here. It says, there are also seven kings, five have fallen, one is, and the other has not yet come. And when he comes, he must continue a short time. Now, this graphic I borrowed from a uh, Beyond Today program. I just borrowed it, took a screenshot. I added all the, added all the words above this undulating line at the bottom. But these uh, um, uh, revela uh, revivals, uh, they are not uh, con contemporaneous. They didn't all happen at the same time. This is a sequence. And there are wide and deep valleys of time in between them. And we have uh, 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 five have fallen. Uh, as of today, six have fallen. And we'll get to that a little later. Uh, you will notice uh, that this Beyond Today program, uh, these seven revivals, uh, they did not exist all at the same time. And uh, they are... Uh, Revivals. Now, you can't uh, revive or come back to life unless first you died. And the Roman Empire is something uh, that existed uh, from 31 AD, 31 BC, uh, until its fall in 476 AD. Uh, and, and this uh, map, the next slide, this, this map, uh, is it moving? It's not moving. There it is. Uh, this is just an approximate map of the Roman Empire. It's, uh, don't try to read it. It's in Italian, and it's uh, too hard to, too, too small to read. But um, uh, this is uh, uh, the Roman Empire, but uh, it once lived, and it lost its life. Uh, the uh, Latin word for uh, uh, live is uh, vivere. Uh, they pronounce the V as a W. Uh, but it's uh, to live or be alive, but it lost its life. And you can think of these seven uh, uh, revivals as uh, political resurrections, sort of. So anyway, uh, uh, today uh, we are going to review the relevance between these seven revivals and the very work we have been commissioned to perform now. Let me repeat that. We are today going to review the relevance of these seven revivals to the very work we have been commissioned to perform now. To begin our narrative, uh, let's introduce the characters. Whenever you pick up a novel or you go to a movie, even a comedy, uh, before you go into the plot, you are introduced to the characters. Usually a movie will do this with, uh, skillfully with dialogue and you learn about who they are, what they look like, what they sound like, and some of their hang-ups or their beliefs or their goals. You know something about the agenda of all of these characters and how they interplay with each other a little bit. So that's what we're going to look at first here. Our cast of characters consists of both allegorical and literal players. Uh, first, we're going to look at the uh, 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 Europa, that's an allegorical figure, and we'll take a look at that, if this will work. Where, am I, where should I be pointing? Anywhere? There it goes. Uh, this is an allegorical uh, figure that the uh, European Union uses. Uh, that's the first uh, allegorical uh, figure in our sequence. Then we're going to look at the influential popes uh, then the uh, Roman revival emperors. Then uh, fourth, we're looking, going to look at uh, the main uh, or allegorical characters, the beast and the false, uh, the scarlet uh, woman. 
uh, and they are the symbols of the villain and the villainous of Revelation. Now, before we proceed any further than this, let's take a little review of our vocabulary. Uh, an allegory is a noun, and it means a story, a poem, or a picture that can be interpreted to reveal a hidden meaning, typically a moral or a political one. An alter ego, that's also a noun, and it means a person's second personality or alternative personality. We have good examples of this in this uh, uh, graphic here, and I've got a little piece of text to describe who is Europa. Europa is an allegorical figure depicted in a Phoenician, as a Phoenician uh, princess from Tyre. The uh, uh, continent of Europe uh, is named after her. The story of her abduction by Zeus in the form of a bull was a Cretan story. The European Union has used Europa as a symbol of pan-Europeanism, depicting her on the uh, G2 coin there, uh, and she's riding a bull, a woman riding a beast. An interesting connection they've made, uh, they've chosen to use as one of their mascots. Uh, and on the, uh, uh, this symbol also, also appears on several other gold coins and commemorative coins. And uh, Europa, she is a type of the scarlet woman of Revelation 17, riding a beast. The second image of her, she's not riding a beast, but if you look at the bottom of the statue there, she's domineering people who are looking up to her. There's this, this, this very uh, telling images here about the destiny of these allegorical figures who uh, are symbolizing uh, one, a church, and others will symbolize a, uh, a uh, nation and our government. Uh, the next uh, uh, set of characters, why is this not working? There we go. Our main leading characters, these are allegorical personalities, of course, and they are, of course, the beast and the scarlet woman. And we all know that uh, the scarlet woman represents a church. And the, uh, the beast is, of course, a government, a governmental system. Uh, those are the main characters. <coughs> now, uh, let's take a look at some of the literal characters now in our narrative. If I can make this move. There we go. The cast of literal characters. Uh, is this what I wanted? No, it skipped the slide. Crowning emperors. These are the uh, church uh, influence behind these seven revivals of the Roman Empire. Uh, the first one there is uh, Epiphanius, Epiphanius. I'm having trouble focusing my glasses, uh, so bear with me. Uh, Epiphanius, and he was a bishop of uh, Salamis, uh, Cyprus. Then there was Pope Leo III, and he crowned Charlemagne. He was the 96th pope, by the way. Then there's Hildebert, uh, a bishop of uh, Mainz, and uh, he crowned Otto I. Now, uh, Apparently, Hildebert didn't sit for a portrait, so uh, the only photo I could find of him was of something he wrote. Don't try to read it, it's too small, and it's in Latin. <laughs> but uh, then there's Pope Clement the uh, Seventh, and he crowned Charles V, and he was the last ruler to be crowned by a pope. Uh, the next pope, Pope Pius the Seventh, uh, handed the crown to Napoleon, who crowned himself. And uh, you get a where, there he is in the dark and down in the corner. Uh, the next set of literal characters we have <clears throat> are, of course, uh, this is not responding. Is this battery you're not working? <clears throat> there we go. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's the one I want. 
Uh, we have uh, the revivals, and he, these are the literal emperors by whom they were uh, uh, underwritten by the popes. Uh, uh, Justinian's reign, uh, and his reign was from <clears throat> uh, 527 <clears throat> to uh, 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 565, pardon me, Um, um, and he was crowned by uh, Epiphanius, we just saw that. Uh, then there was Charlemagne, and then there was, uh, keep going here, Charlemagne, and then there's Otto the Great. I'm, I'm finding that expression on his face a little curious. He looks a little frightened of his assignment. I uh, can't tell what he's thinking. Uh, and then there's Charles V, and then there's uh, Napoleon's reign, and he is crowning himself, of course. Uh, and then uh, there was uh, the, the one to come, and then the, the Rome Berlin axis. This is the one that kind of overlaps. Uh, uh, if you're a baby boomer, uh, your parents lived through this, and uh, this is a relevant chapter that we're going to take a closer look at. Um, because it's so recent, and it's the sixth one. And this is the sixth one that has already fallen, and there's one to go. Uh, the Rome-Berlin Axis, and that was uh, in 1933 to 1945, about 12 years, and Pope Pius XI uh, 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 was in office during that time from 1922 to 1939. King Victor Emmanuel III of Italy appointed Mussolini the youngest prime minister in Italian history, October 31st, 1922. Hitler, an Australian-born German politician, was named Chancellor of Germany January 30th, 1933, and he ruled until his death in 1945, uh, as, did, uh, as did Mussolini. The other of course, the other one has not yet come. Whether he's valid or not, uh, there he is. Anyway, he hasn't come, and that's what the last slide said. So let's advance here. Uh, the Apostle John was writing about this in 90 to 95 AD. The original Roman Empire was uh, still in its early development uh, when he was writing hadn't fallen yet. It was still early. Uh, uh, John was projected in time to the rise of the sixth revival of, Ro of the Roman Empire, the Rome-Berlin Axis, 1933 to 1945. He was projected in time and he stopped there and he, he changed his language here. That's a duration of about 12 years and yet he doesn't refer to it in the past tense now. He referred to it in the uh, uh, future events. He uses the, the past perfect tense of have, uh, the others that he uses have fallen. But this one he says is. He uses it in a present tense. He stops in his time uh, uh, reference uh, with this uh, uh, revival right here. Daniel wrote um, uh, of these same events in the mid-500s uh, B.C., 5, 535 to 550, they think. Uh, he wrote about these same events, which we will look at in a minute. Uh, how could they write in detail about events that had not happened, as though they had already happened? Uh, how could they do that? Well, God tells us why, how, and why he did it. Uh, he, he was inspired to write history in advance. Uh, we have uh, Isaiah, we're there. Isaiah uh, 49, 46, uh, verses 9 to 10, he says, I am the God, I'll, re I'll read it off the wall, uh, I am God and there is none like me, <clears throat> declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying of my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. Nothing's gonna restrain God from doing the impossible. And uh, uh, he also, um, are my pages sticking together? 
the next, let's go to the next slide here. Um, they're not advancing. Two other versions of that same sentiment from the previous verse, uh, one is uh, from Romans about, uh, he says, he quickens the dead and he calls those things which are, are not as though they already were. And uh, Moffat says it a little differently, who calls into being what does not exist. So it's no problem for God to write history in advance. And we're going to see just how accurately God does that. Uh, I'm going to move now to uh, scripture. Uh, most of these slides are going to be scriptures from now on. And uh, uh, we're going to look now at Daniel. Turn to Daniel. Follow along with me if you like here. The fourth beast, Daniel 7, and we're going to read verses 7 and 8. Um, and this is possibly written around 550 B.C. Uh, quote, After this I saw in the night visions, and behold, a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible, exceedingly strong. It had huge iron teeth, and it was devouring, breaking in pieces, and uh, trembling, the, uh, trampling the residue with its feet. It was, a, it was a different from all the other beasts uh, that were before it, and it had ten horns. I was considering the horns, and there was another horn, a little one, coming up among them, before whom three of the first horns were plucked up uh, uh, by the roots. And, and there in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking pompous words or great things. Now I have an excerpt here. God has been very generous with giving his church the scholarship and the understanding with his spirit to understand and to decode what uh, Daniel has just written here. I'm going to read uh, an excerpt. It's about a page and a half. Bear with me. It's worth the listen. Uh, the Ten Horns and the Little Horn. This is from a commentary by the United Church of God, Beyond the Day Commentary, from March of uh, 2004. The Roman Empire fell in ancient times, yet the empire was to continue until the end time glorious coming of Christ, whose everlasting kingdom would take over from it. Uh, how uh, could this be? As already noted, the Roman Empire was, had experienced a number of revivals. This is where the ten horns of the fourth beast come in, symbolic of ten kingdoms. Notice the expression three of the first horns in verse 8. If, the, the, if some of the horns are first, then there must be others to follow. Um, uh, this uh, uh, world uh, 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 seems to imply, uh, and that, excuse me, this would seem to imply that the ten horns of this vision are consecutive, unlike the ten simultaneous kings uh, represented uh, by the ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's, Nebuchadnezzar's dreams. This is a different image, different uh, context here. Uh, the phrase in verse 8 could have been rendered uh, the first uh, three horns. This seems to indicate that there would be ten revivals of the Roman Empire the first three of which were uprooted or subdued by an additional little horn, and the last of which would itself comprise ten district power, distinct powers. Uh, late in the fourth century, the east-west division of the Roman Empire became permanent, uh, with uh, uh, one emperor reigning from Rome over the western uh, Roman Empire and another emperor reigning from Constantinople, modern Istanbul or Turkey, uh, uh, over the Eastern Rome, Roman Empire. The Western Roman Empire fell during the next century, but the Eastern Roman Empire, uh, Roman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, continued until 1453. It is the Western Empire centered at Rome that has experienced a number of revivals as the, the Western Empire. Uh, as the Western Empire collapsed in the fifth century, these groups of uh, barbarian, three groups of barbarian invaders 
sought to succeed the Roman emperors. Indeed, these groups, the Vandals, the Heruli, and the Ostrogoths, each successively sought to receive uh, uh, official uh, recognition from the Eastern Roman Emperor. As a legitimate confirmation of Rome, uh, Roman rule in the West. Yet there was a problem. These invaders, from the perspective of the Western religious leader, the Bishop of Rome, or Pope, these barbarians were not Orthodox Catholic, Trinitarians, having adopted a form of Christianity known as uh, Arianism. At the Pope's behead urging, the Vandals were eventually overthrown by the Eastern Roman Emperor. The Heruli were also overthrown at papal urging. The Eastern Emperor, uh, sending uh, the Ostrogoths uh, as uh, its agents to carry it out, this out, uh, and then the Ostrogoths themselves were later overthrown by the Eastern Roman forces yet again at papal behest. So there's three little horns plucked up by the roots, by that little horn, that little church, a little horn of a church, horning in on things, wasn't he? And uh, in uh, following the Justinian, uh, uh, following the three uprootings, Justinian, was, we've seen him on the screen already, uh, Justinian became the first of the uh, revivals of the Roman Empire uh, and uh, his uh, imperial territory, and he placed it under the management of the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, uh, he was followed, of course, by Charlemagne and Otto the Great and Charles V and Napoleon and the Rome-Berlin Axis. In 1803, Francis II of Austria rejected the title in the face of uh, the growing power of Napoleon Bonaparte, s s who uh, had himself received the imperial crown from the Pope two years later. The Pope actually handed the crown to him, and so he, that Pope didn't literally crown him, but of course he was sponsoring him behind the scenes. After the fall of Napoleon, another revival of, the Roman, uh, of Rome was still to follow. Benito Mussolini sought to restore the Roman Empire in 1929, he signed the uh, Lateran Treaty with the papacy, and that was with uh, Pope uh, Pius XI, uh, 1922 to 1939. That was his uh, tenure in office. Establishing papal sovereignty over Vatican City. Roman Catholicism as the Italian state religion and papal recognition of Mussolini's government. In partnership with Mussolini was Adolf Hitler, who sought uh, restoration of the imperial Roman tradition in Germany. The Vatican signed a concordat, remember that word concordat, we'll look at that in a minute, with Hitler in 1933, protecting the rights of the church in Nazi Germany and giving Hitler's regime an outward semblance of legitimacy. That concordant, it means, uh, a concordant is a covenant, or that is a convention between the Holy See, that's another name for the Pope, uh, and a, con, uh, a sovereign state that defines the relationship between the Catholic Church and the state in matters that concern both, that is, the recognition and privileges of the Catholic Church in a particular country and with uh, secular matters that affect church interests. Now, a uh, footnote to that. Uh, this is kind of a uh, under the table behind the scenes. This is not done terribly openly. This is silent little agreements, an understanding that's developed uh, unknown to the general populace. Uh, now, a little footnote on this subject. It says, due to the substantial remapping of Europe that took place after the First World War, new concordance with legal successors, successor states were necessary. 
the post world uh, post world war 1 era saw the greatest proliferation of concordance in history a lot going on under the table isn't there influence that's what it's about influence now let's take a look here at the relationship between what's happened here with the sixth revival and what's happened with us where do we fit into this picture uh, this is a miraculous event by the hand of God. What other prophetic event was taking place in the mid-1920s and the early 30s? That's the time when Herbert W. Armstrong began to understand the book of Revelation. Let's see if we can advance the slide here. Come on. Let's leave that on the screen for a while. Uh, uh, in Revelation 3, uh, and I'm going to read verses 7, 8, and 10. There's only verse 10 on the screen here, I think. No, only verse 8 on the screen. Uh, this says, uh, uh, He who has the key of David. What is the key of David? It's the key to the kingdom of God. He who uh, has the key to, uh, of David who opens and no man shuts, and shuts and no man opens. I know your works. See, I have set before you an open door, and no one can shut it. For you have a little strength, have kept my word, and have not denied my name. Because you have kept my command, the word of my patience, uh, to preserve, I will also keep you from the hour of trial which shall uh, come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. That verse 10 sets a time uh, marker there. He's talking about the end of time, a time of trouble that affects the whole world. What else could that be? That is an open door that opened at this time, the time that we're talking about with uh, the Church of God in the modern era. That open door was the opportunity to preach the gospel to many nations, even though the uh, truth, uh, and it has many enemies and still does, it has many adversaries, yet no one was able to stop it. At uh, precisely the right time, God set a door before Mr. Armstrong to proclaim the gospel all over the world. He also used him to train the ministry, the church grew, and, and its radio broadcast later, uh, The World Tomorrow, uh, was heard uh, uh, worldwide uh, as both a broadcast and a telecast. Uh, I have a short excerpt here from, a secular ex excerpt here from those, the uh, uh, Wikipedia about Herbert Armstrong. It says, quote, he was uh, offered a temporary 15-minute slot on KORE Eugene, Oregon, on October 9, 1933. That became a permanent half-hour slot on January 7, 1934. Amazing parallel dates here. Mr. Armstrong founded the Radio Church of God with the first broadcast, first broadcast in 1934. See if we can advance another slide here. There he is. Familiar picture? Recognize him? Uh, that was January uh, 7th, 1934. Uh, and uh, Armstrong's radio program eventually reached millions with its message and the imminent end, uh, end of the world uh, to be followed by the, I'm not reading that well. My glasses are giving me trouble. Let me back up and start that sentence again. Armstrong founded the Radio Church of God with the first broadcast in 1934 to serve as the home church as uh, his pioneering broadcast-based ministry. Broadcast-based ministry. It wasn't just a local uh, community church, was it? Armstrong's radio program eventually reached millions with its message of the imminent end of the world to be followed by the second coming of Christ. 
In 1968, the Radio Church of God changed its name to reflect its worldwide growth. Uh, now, since we know that Satan is the prince of the power of the air, Ephesians 2.2, Jesus had to have made it possible for those radio and later television broadcasts to go out through the air. That's the vehicle that carries it. You can be sure that Satan did not want that to go out. Yet it did, and it still does. The church also had a publishing ministry. Most, of, about half of us remember all of this. If you're younger, you didn't live through these, this period of time. But uh, it's, it had a, a, a vast publishing ministry. Let's, let's hit the next slide. Yeah, there it is. There's the, uh, the Plain Truth uh, it began its publication, and that was in 1934. Uh, and uh, he had, he was right on time, but he was also, next slide. If you can, yeah. He was right on time and he was right on topic. Take a look at that headline. That's relevant. That's what was going on in Europe right when he wrote it. He was uh, matching the, uh, the timetable here, wasn't he? I, I read this paragraph because uh, to begin with, he didn't seek to be on radio. It was offered to him. In other words, it was a door opening. He had to walk through it, but the door was there, and it was presented to him. He was offered time on the radio, and it grew from there. Uh, the church also had a, a vast publishing um, ministry. Uh, Mr. Armstrong used to say that since the fall of Jerusalem in 70 AD until the early 1930s, there was nothing proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom of God with such power uh, throughout the world. Initially to the English-speaking nations, but it also grew rapidly into an international work. And nothing had uh, been done since uh, the fall of Jerusalem with such power. Uh, let's look at another one here. He's right on topic, and he's also... Let's back up if we can. Another relevant headline there, isn't it? The plain truth ahead of its time. That was from 1941. And look, he's got... He's, 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 he's revealed Hitler's true colors here in his headline. And we're early in the war. We're, we didn't even know this uh, would fall yet. But uh, he is what was ahead of the game, wasn't he? And uh, he also had a vast, uh, uh, the narratives that opened the door. Uh, we've all read his autobiography and uh, Mystery of the Ages and uh, um, hundreds of other titles. He was a very prolific author. And we can't go into all of that. I want to let you, let's take a look at Acts. Leave this on the screen, but, but uh, uh, let's take a look at Acts 14, 27. While we're on this subject, uh, it says from there, Paul and Barnabas sailed to Antioch, where they had been uh, commended uh, to the grace of, uh, of God for the work which they had uh, completed. Now, when they had come and gathered the church together, they reported all that God had done with them. They didn't boast about what they did, did they? You know, that was what God had done. He's doing the work. It's his work. And uh, he said uh, that he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Yes, he opens the door, and he gives us the courage and the wisdom to walk through them. If the preaching of the true gospel made possible by the gift of God of that open door, starting in the mid-1920s and 30s, if that had not happened when it happened, the way it happened, with true doctrine restored, we would not be here today in this room. We wouldn't even know each other. The work wouldn't, be, wouldn't exist. It had to, have a, had to have a beginning and a dramatic one, and at the right time. And God uh, 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 has uh, give us all of the 
tools we need to do the work, but also to be overcomers and to be changing and developing our own lives for a future role in his family. He's opened all of those doors for us, hasn't he? And we have to walk through them. It's easy to overlook or forget uh, recent church history, but God opened the door for his end time work right on time and with prophetic precision. Uh, the mid 20s, when the sixth uh, of the Roman Empire began, and we've reviewed that already, we, we know who, who when came to power then and when. About one third or one half of the members of the uh, church today possibly uh, are old enough to have lived through man's attempt to close that door, the door that God had opened. Nearly a decade of heresy infiltrated the church administration in the late 1980s. Now, I lived in Pasadena then, and I didn't participate in publishing the church booklets or uh, magazines. I, I worked mostly for the performing arts, and so my, my assignments were not uh, uh, doctrinally related. But some of my friends who wrote literature had to resign when the doctrine started watering down. They, no, I can't write that. So it, 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 it was infiltrating. It slithered in slowly and subtly at first, but it, it gained a lot of momentum over the decade. Um, subtly, gradually watering down and ultimately and openly, openly abandoning revealed and restored doctrine returning to cunningly devised fables. We, 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 you, you know what those fables are. Uh, and we also uh, 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 sought the approval through uh, applying for accreditation to the college. We were seeking uh, uh, academic approval, but to earn ac academic uh, accreditation, you have to compromise your curriculum greatly. It wouldn't be Ambassador College anymore if that, that uh, prevailed. Uh, and also, they were applying for acceptance to, with the National Council of Churches. What's left with true doctrine after that? Seeking the ecclesiastical and academic approval of men instead of God. Uh, when the uh, uh, church at that time changed its name. Uh, it finally renamed itself, and I won't give you their name now, you know what it is, but guess whose name's missing from that church's name? God's name is not in there. Why should it be? It was no longer his church. God says, you have not uh, forsook it, forsaken my name, but here they did didn't want anything to do with the true doctrines. But no man could shut the door that those men tried to close. Uh, like Ezra, God provided, Ezra, that is, uh, God provided uh, faithful servants who stood in the gap and submitted uh, to God's will. Uh, and uh, many of them are still in church leadership today, faithful servants, ongoing. Uh, but uh, I remember I lived through, and so did many of you, you lived through that infamous decade of heresy, and it was very dis dis disconcerting. I was in there doing my graphic thing for the auditorium, and uh, I, uh, I think I had to do an issue of the Envoy. Well, oh, that was earlier. That was long, while well, Mr. Armstrong was still alive. But uh, I had to keep telling myself, uh, God is allowing this for a reason. I knew it was wrong, but I knew uh, God's going to correct it when he's ready. And he did, of course. Mr. Armstrong wrote his autobiography, and I, you see it on the screen there. Uh, and a lot of people criticized him for that. Uh, it ran serially in The Plain Truth for several decades, and then it was uh, published in, in these volumes here later. Uh, but, uh, and he was documenting the very process and progress of that open door. This was not a autobiography bragging about himself. He was, if you've read it, he has to describe how he was humbled. He tried to disprove true doctrine 
uh, he didn't believe it, and he tried to fight against it, and he couldn't win. He couldn't disprove it. And he was humbled. He was humbled financially. He was, uh, at one time, a very, a very successful, famous advertising writer. And uh, that experience was really training him to do God's work. But at the time, he was prosperous and uh, successful. And uh, at first, he was ashamed of the Sabbath. Uh, his, his wife wanted, wanted to keep the Sabbath. And, oh, we can't do that. I'll lose all my friends, my important business friends. So this was not a boastful autobiography at all. The Apostle Paul also found himself needing to explain who he was and how he came to do the work God called him to do. Luke was inspired to record uh, some of Paul's autobiographical accounts of his calling, his repentance, his conversion, his training, how he had to be humbled and cleaned up and do a 180 just throwing away everything. He, he says he, what he used to be, uh, practice and believe was rubbish. He had to change. It was not a boastful account that he was giving of himself either. Uh, some of those autobiograph autobiographical episodes that Paul, uh, uh, that Luke recorded for Paul, uh, one is uh, some scriptures are in Acts 9, also in Acts 22, Acts 26, you can find some, some of that in Galatians 1, 11 to 3, and in Ephesians 3, uh, accounts of what God did to him and for him and through him. Not a boasting, was it? Now, let's get back to where we were in Revelation 17. Let me check my time here. Wake up, wake up. All right, we've got a little time. Uh, going to have to move fast here, but uh, now we were talking about the uh, Scarlet Woman. Oh, yeah, that's our last one. Look at that uh, circulation, six, uh, six million. Now, in Revelation 17, uh, it's uh, the judgment of the great whore, and uh, this section has, uh, this uh, chapter has uh, three sections. The first section is the woman seated on the beast, that's uh, verses one to six, and then uh, the significance of the woman sitting on the beast, and the third section, the punishment of the woman sitting on the beast. So let's read that first part here and get a little commentary. Um, and it says here, the woman uh, and, the, and the scarlet beast. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowels came and talked with me, saying, Come, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who sits on many waters. What are those waters? God will tell us in a minute here. With whom the kings of the earth uh, have committed fornication, the inhabitants of the earth who, made the, who were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. A woman is a symbol of a nation or a church. Now, I'm tempted to just stop and say, whoa, what about these harsh words? Whore, harlot. They're embarrassing words almost. They're harsh words, and God used them. Why did he use these terms? Because he wanted to expose their characteristics. Not the character, they're lacking that, but their characteristics. The characteristics of these characters, and he wants to, you to understand their motive, their methods, their agenda. The woman is a symbol of a nation uh, uh, or a church, and in this case, it's a church. The, this harlot is a whore, a prostitute, sexually permissive for payment, who sits on many peoples. Waters is a symbol of peoples or nations. The woman and the beast, where's the beast coming from? He's coming up out of human civilization, coming up out of the waters. It's human government, a, a, a last razoo attempt for globalism. That's what this beast, is. his agenda is. Um, she's no ordinary whore. She is artful, 
sophisticated, with whom the nations of the world have committed fornication. The woman requires diplomatic skills to sit on many centers of influence. That's current history. We've, that's going on yet today. Great skill, clever, cunning deceiver. There is no love between the woman and the beast, however. They hate each other. They pretend not to. Each covers the sins of the others for political gain. Their combined agenda, their goal, is a world empire exercising dominion over many subjects and nations. In modern terms, globalism. The inhabitants of the earth were made drunk with the wine of her fornication. Corruption spreads to all of her subjects who do not comprehend that they have been seduced. Satan has indeed deceived the whole world, not just some of it. But God has called his people out, and we have a work to do, a miraculous work, because we walked through that door he opened. Uh, Revelation uh, 17, verses 3 to 4, says, So she, he carried me away in the spirit. Uh, if we can, can you go to the next slide? I can't make this work. Um, Revelation 17, 3. Uh, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast, which was full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. And the woman was arrayed in uh, uh, purple and scarlet, and adorned with gold and precious stones, and having in her hand a, a, a golden cup full of abominations and filthiness of, of fornication. John saw her sitting on many waters, and now he sees her sitting on the beast. She holds power over the many peoples, and the power over the beast. Now, uh, Scarlet is, is a, you've heard the name, uh, Sins is, uh, is Scarlet. Uh, it's 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 a, associated with sin and uh, corruption. Uh, uh, now, on her forehead, Revelation 17:5 says, "On her forehead is a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and the abominations of the earth." Now, uh, this is a a little tidbit I got from one of Bob Fay's uh, uh, recorded sermons. Uh, he said that. Uh, uh, some of the harlots of the day, they used to uh, uh, write their name on their foreheads. Uh, and uh, my glasses are troubling me. Uh, uh, the Roman harlots wore labels on their foreheads with their names. It's how they advertised. The scarlet woman's, woman's true identity, mother of harlots, who inspires imitation daughters descending from her. Uh, today, Catholic and Protestants are uh, working together more and more because they realize they have so much in common. Sunday worship, uh, uh, immortal soul, uh, uh, in Trinity, Christmas, Easter, uh, Good Friday, sunrise service, uh, while downplaying their minor differences. So much in common. Uh, they just... Uh, the, the Protestants just came dragging Catholic baggage in with them. Uh, now the second section of Revelation, I'm going to uh, abbreviate this, uh, but uh, it's uh, the, the seven heads, uh, I'll, I'll read the scripture, uh, but the angel said to me, why did you marvel? I tell you that the mystery uh, is the hidden truth of the woman and of the beast that carries her. Uh, which has been had seven heads and ten horns, that beast you saw was and is not and will ascend out of the bottomless pit and go to perdition or, perdition or destruction. And those who dwell with uh, on the earth will marvel, those whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. For they see the beast that was and is not and yet is or shall be present. Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are seven mountains on which the woman sits. And uh, uh, when he refers to ten, that's, that's including the three that were plucked up. Uh, now let's uh, fast forward a little bit here. The, 
um, I want to get to the part where she's, uh, I'm going to spick, skip the second section here. Let's look at the, the third section of Revelation 17 for the sake of time. Uh, uh, it says here, the punishment of the woman sitting on the beast. Uh, then he said to me, uh, uh, this is Revelation 17. Uh, this is slide number 36, by the way, if you want to go take it there. Uh, uh, the uh, waters which you saw, this is Revelation 17, 15 and 18. Then he said to me, the waters which you saw were where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. There again, he defines what the waters mean. Civilization, mankind, his whole system. Uh, you, you don't leave much out when you say peoples, plural, multitudes, plural, nations, plural, tongues, plural. Uh, and the ten horns which you saw on the beasts, uh, these were, uh, will hate the harlot, make her desolate and naked, eat her flesh and burn her with fire, for God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his purpose, to be of one mind, to give their kingdom to the beast until the words of God are fulfilled. And the woman whom you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Uh, in other words, uh, this woman, uh, this scarlet woman, she's uh, hard to live with, isn't she? She wants to run everything. She's uh, riding a beast that's a lot stronger than she is, and yet she's telling it where to go. And they finally tell her, get off my back. Enough already, and they destroy her. So this is the the fruit that they have bearing for themselves, and uh, he says that's enough. The rivalry between the church and the state that was always there, they were always vying for power. Who's going to be the most dominant one, the more dominant one? And they will, and it, that that house divided it comes to a surface to the surface the revelation narrative does not end here but for the sake of time i'm going to uh, ask you to give yourself an assignment and study revelation 18 this is not the whole story this is uh, leading up to even more but we can't tell the whole story but revelation 17 or 18 is it talks about the fall of babylon the great uh, and that's a a more complete context of where this all this narrative has been going. In summary, let's go to yes, there it is. Thank you. In summary, we have looked at what today. We have looked at uh, the revelation of deception, the cunning, recurring agenda of human globalism. We've also met the characters, both literal and allegorical. And those allegories have been very descriptive of the character or characteristics of the evil participants, the revivals of the Roman Empire. Third, we have uh, looked at uh, God as the God of history. He writes it accurately and in advance. And God fulfills his prophecies with great precision. And we're living witnesses of that. We're here doing his work on time when he wanted it done. And he didn't fail us, did he? he he's kept his word, he kept his plan in, intact. He also reveals the meaning of prophecy to his servants. We have uh, such an abundance of uh, commentaries of our own and sermons and understanding of these mysterious books in Revelation especially. And he reveals the meaning of prophecy to his servants. And he has given us an open door that no man can shut to proclaim the truth. There's one more slide, one more thing we've looked at. And if you can take us to that one. There it is. The last thing we've looked at here is the fact that now six have fallen. Six have fallen and the one to come well, here I'm going to wrap this up with a conclusion out of Daniel 7, 
one scripture and then one very brief verse after that. And I hope we're coming close to being on time. Uh, Daniel 7, uh, verses 11 to 14. I watched then, then, I watched then because of the sound of the pompous words which the horn was speaking, that horn, that horned in and tried to run everything. Pompous, very uh, presumptuous uh, assumptions that the papacy, I, I have a, I don't have time to read it, but there's a commentary uh, from, uh, Mar uh, uh, what is it, from Clark's commentary. Uh, all of the papal claims to uh, infallibility and they're qualified to forgive sin, all, uh, that's about 15 or 20 uh, features of that uh, of faith that uh, defies and usurps God's. These are all prerogatives of God and they usurp them to themselves. I can't go into that too, not, not, not enough time. But it says here, uh, the pompous words which the horn was speaking, I watched till the beast was slain and its body destroyed and given to the burning flame. As for the rest of the beast, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. Verse 13, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, who's that? Coming with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, who's that? And he, uh, and they brought him near before him. Then to him, Christ was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one which cannot be destroyed. One last verse here out of Revelation 22 and verse 20. John is quoting Christ. Uh, he said, he who testifies to these things says, quote, surely I am coming quickly. That means when he comes, he will be coming swiftly. But it doesn't say he's coming immediately. He has to wait for the Father to give him the signal. And that's not, that hasn't happened yet. But when that... When he gets the, go, the word go, he's coming quickly. But it's not uh, immediacy. What does immediacy mean? Uh, immediacy uh, is the quality of bringing uh, one into direct and instant involvement with something giving rise to a sense of urgency or excitement. By the way uh, of this message of the prophets, of the prophetic context, the immediacy is on us, right here, right now, to continue doing his work. Six have fallen, and the one to come has got to go, and there won't be another. With six fallen and one revival soon to come, let's continue to do God's work with immediacy, with zeal and urgency, as diligent watchmen, right here, right now, through that door that God has set before us, which no man can shut. <laughs>